you all for coming this afternoon. Um, I appreciate the great attendance for a very serious uh, subject matter. First, a couple of things. Um, Ron Richard has a family issue that's keeping him down in Joplin, and he uh, wishes he could be here. He did want me to pass along that he has read the materials and scripts, uh, the conclusions of this report, and uh, agrees with both uh, Senator Schmidt and Schaefer in their positions. Uh, at the end, uh, we're going to have a couple of senators walk through various pieces of uh, the material. At the end, we will be taking questions at the end from the press corps. Uh, but after near a year of asking questions without great answers once the Planned Parenthood video surfaced last summer, as you know, Senator Dempsey formed the Sanctity of Life Committee, uh, and then as that committee uh, went on and looked for further testimony, uh, mainly from Planned Parenthood and the pathologist, um, Ron Richards' pro tem then uh, last December, I believe, in November and December, issued subpoenas for some for just testimony, some for testimony and for information. Um, the committee was asked to uh, look at the in-depth analysis of what uh, fetuses and body parts were being used and how they were uh, being disposed of at the Planned Parenthood facilities. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to note that to get to the point we're at, um, that we had to almost have a contempt order issued against these folks to finally get them to let us look at some of the material. And so that material has really produced you know, more questions than it has answered. And you'll hear a little bit more about that um, as we go on. Um, the uh, most stunning discovery is that the informed consent procedures and forms from Planned Parenthood demonstrate the shocking um, disregard for the safety of women. Uh, and I think no matter what side of this you're on, uh, that's an issue that you're very concerned about and you want to make sure uh, we protect as we go forward. Uh, so I thought before we get to the findings, we'd have uh, Senator Schaefer first speak about the recent U.S. Uh, Supreme Court decision. Senator Schaefer, thank you. Thank you. So before we get into the individual things that, uh, that we found in documents and a lot of things, uh, frankly, that we didn't find that we thought we would see, I do want to talk about the Supreme Court's decision last week in Hellerstedt. Because it is a very important case as it relates to Missouri law. There are similarities between Missouri and Texas, but they are not the exact same laws, and I think that's important to keep in mind. There are differences, and we are currently looking at that right now. Also on top of that, the state of Missouri entered into a settlement agreement with Planned Parenthood for compliance issues. That settlement agreement, regardless of the Hellerstedt case, still stands, and I would fully expect the Attorney General and the Governor of the state of Missouri to uphold that settlement. I think in Hellerstedt, the judgment of state legislatures have been completely kicked to the curb on an issue of public safety. Uh, this case proves that since the court's entry into politics in 1973 with Roe versus Wade, it has had to justify its use of raw judicial power with confusing judicial opinions and even violating its own previous precedent. Justice Thomas points out the court had muddied the water and brought confusion to lower courts and to legislatures as well, and I think we're going to see that play out across the country. The court's opinion and our investigation came to two completely different conclusions. And that's why I think it's relevant to point this out now before we go into some of the issues that came out specifically from the documents. Our review shows that the callous treatment by the abortion industry of women requires state legislatures to offer more safeguards, not fewer. Today we present real evidence based on an actual investigation into Planned Parenthood's own documents, as well as witness testimony taken by the Senate Sanctity of Life Committee. The evidence shows that Planned Parenthood's procedures border on outright medical malpractice, which would not be tolerated in any other area of service delivery in the medical field. It is important to highlight the fact that the evidence we have uncovered clearly demonstrates why last week's Supreme Court decision was so misguided and why legislatures, and not courts, should determine what level of safety regulations are appropriate for the citizens of their state. First, let's take a look at the many discrepancies we have between what happens with the fetal tissue when it leaves Planned Parenthood in St. Louis. Planned Parenthood documents state that the entire fetus, arms, legs, spine, head, all collected after an abortion, are apparently all delivered to the pathologist, not just a representative sample as is required by state law. Missouri law mandates a representative sample of fetal tissue be submitted to the pathologist for re review, and you're going to hear a lot about the pathologist and Planned Parenthood's uh, contract and the relationship with the pathologist. But according to Planned Parenthood documents, tissue from a fetus is immersed in formulin, which is a preservative, rendering it unusable for tissue donation. However, the Missouri Department of Health's own regulations state that tissue sent to the pathologist shall not be submerged in formulin or any other preservative. 
Yet what came out of the committee was all tissue is in fact going to pathologist, not just a representative sample. It appears that Planned, Pan Planned Parenthood is possibly violating state law by sending the entire fetus to pathologist, not in formulin or another preservative, or immersing fetal parts that have yet to be reviewed by a pathologist in preservative solution, which would also be a violation of state law. Because the pathologist pleaded the fifth when we asked him to come before the Senate and produce documents and testimony, we don't know exactly how much of the tissue is being delivered from Planned Parenthood and if that tissue has been treated with preservative or not. We discovered that Metashore, the company that contracts with pathology services to dispose of waste, at one point during, this, during the process, was illegally disposing of fetal tissue from the St. Louis facility in the state of Indiana. The Vice President for Regular, Regulatory Affairs for Metashore has said to the press that he believes pathology services was only disposing of small bits of tissue, maybe the size of a thumbnail. And I think what you're going to hear when you hear about some of the pathology reports that we were able to see information, there are clearly tissue samples and entire bodies aborted that went to the pathologist as long as 20 weeks, which would be substantially larger than a thumbnail. So that begs the question, where is that material going? So with that, I do want to turn it over to Senator Schmidt to answer some of the questions specifically <coughs> about pathologists, and then we'll move up from there and take questions after. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did have an opportunity along with Senator Schaefer to review the documents that were produced uh, after a subpoena was issued and, of course, uh, towards the end of session when the contempt order uh, was threatened. There's three issues that I want to touch on, and then there will be some other folks, and then we'll have some time for some questions. But first, uh, the record of the sale of human fetal tissue is full of alarming gaps. And what I mean by that is a contract was produced, a two-pager that is essentially a term sheet um, for a gross sample or a micro sample. Now, as was discovered and what was mentioned by Senator Schaefer, um, the reports that we saw, the pathology reports seem to indicate the gross sample, there may have been one micro sample in the entire uh, 300 plus that we saw in the, uh, the sample that we received from Planned Parenthood. But what is troubling is that that term sheet um, between the service agreement between Pathology Services and Reproductive Health Services of St. Louis is only two pages and is undated and incomplete. It references a confidentiality agreement, uh, which was not produced and reportedly cannot be located. Uh, Pathology Services is uh, noted as a subcontractor, and we're not really sure who the contractor is, but as it relates to the confidentiality agreement, we don't know what's in that. Uh, presumably, that would be uh, very substantive to this conversation. Uh, it wasn't produced, cannot be located, and also was interesting to note is that it was not produced to the Attorney General, but that um, omission was not noted by the Attorney General. So that is certainly something new that we wanted to highlight that, again, raises some more questions as opposed to answers. Throughout the consent forms that we did have an opportunity to review, um, that again, were not personal consent forms, but rather the forms that were updated through the years, uh, Planned Parenthood seems to go out of its way to make sure that patients and women are only calling them. And specifically, quote, I might quote, if you are feeling worried and think you need to go to the emergency room, call us. It does not direct um, women to call the emergency room or go to the emergency room in that particular um, instance. Um, we also discovered that there are communications between key players in the videos from last year and Planned Parenthood of St. Louis. You may recall that last year, St. Louis was uh, referenced um, by high-ranking Planned Parenthood officials as an untapped market. Moreover, more than just as an untapped market, Dr. Eisenberg was specifically mentioned in those videos, and there were emails that were produced that are directed to Dr. Eisenberg, um, uh, noting that he missed conference calls to discuss particular items, um, for example, um, they referenced further discussion of any outstanding issues related to the Biomax fetal tissue donation situation. Biomax was uh, the group that was filming um, <coughs> those conversations with Planned Parenthood officials. Um, the email correspondence does not elaborate what those conversations were on the conference call. So again, uh, more questions are certainly raised than answers. We do not know the substance of those conversations, what was being talked about in the time frame of when these videos were released, but we do know that Dr. Eisenberg was emailed by high-ranking Planned Parenthood officials nationally and uh, through the folks locally in St. Louis um, to discuss these matters. We just don't know what they discussed. 
be certainly willing to answer any questions once we get through the lineup here. Thank you. Senator Hunter. Thank you. Well, in reviewing the Planned Parenthood pathology reports, the Senate noted a number of uh, discrepancies that raise concerns over missing fetal tissue and therefore possible illegal sales and diversion into the baby body part industry. Um, we, we reviewed over 300 surgical pathology reports and there was an alarming trend that surfaced. Uh, these reports were listed by the pathologist, Dr. Miller, <coughs> by age, by the type of pathological report, and by the findings. Four reports stood out as glaring discrepancies. Um, these are reports that fetuses of fairly late fetal age, developmental age, um, were listed as no fetal parts identified. Um, there was one fetus of 17 weeks and one day, another fetus of 20 weeks and two days, another fetus of 12 weeks, and another um, fetus um, nine, week, nine weeks and one day. Um, these, these are fairly late-term abortions. Um, I think many of us have the experience of looking at our own baby's ultrasounds or those of family or friends, and at nine weeks, 12 weeks, 20 weeks, there are baby parts clearly identifiable. But, and so the, we, we in the Senate are aware of no logical or medical reason why these, these, why these pathological specimens should be unable to identify any fetal parts whatsoever. Um, Dr. Miller, um, I, we, we, this raises a number of questions. Did Dr. Miller accurately report what he found? in which case this Planned Parenthood did not deliver the fetal parts to, uh, Miller, uh, to Miller in contradiction to their, their testimony and their statements? Or, did they, uh, or, did, or, or was Dr. Miller so sloppy he just lost the tissue? Or, were these ti or was this tissue being diverted into the, into the illicit uh, fetal tissue sale industry? So um, this is, want, as, as, uh, as uh, Senator, Senator Keogh said earlier, uh, much, of, much of what we found raises more questions than answers. Certainly none of this was mentioned in the Attorney General's uh, so-called investigation uh, earlier this year. Um, Senator Sater would like to, will be uh, addressing the issue of, uh, I'm sorry, Senator Riddle. Good afternoon. One aspect that I've focused on since my time in this building has been to make sure the women in our state have accurate information about their health care. When Planned Parenthood's information was reviewed, I was horrified to discover their own written policies put more focus, more emphasis on their public image rather than the health and safety of the women they serve. For example, on their consent forms, the emergency number they post is their clinic number. Oftentimes, 911 is not listed at all, and if it is, it's in a, a smaller font underneath the clinic number. Women are directed to call Planned Parenthood for an emergency, but to call the 911 number if it's a life-threatening situation. Now, I would offer you this. I'm a mother, and my second child we lost to a miscarriage. Rather quickly, I ended up in a life-threatening situation. I had already birthed one child. I had an idea of what to expect. Do you think our teenage daughters are going to understand that they're in a life-threatening situation and not call 911 based on what Planned Parenthood has to offer? This level of callous disregard for the safety of women in our state is an apparent effort to protect their own business model from being damaged by news of a botched abortion and patients ending up in ER. This information is shocking. It should be shocking to everyone listening. This kind of deliberate organizational effort to steer patients away from emergency medical treatment very, may very well constitute malpractice, medical malpractice. And it's a reckless endangerment of the women in our state. 
another one of their forms relating to the chemical abortions, the pills that are, are administered. Those pills cause significant bleeding, yet there's no reference to calling 911 in an emergency. There's another story that you can maybe relate to. In my research on previous legislation, another Midwestern state, we had parents finding their teenage daughters in a pool of blood the next morning, no longer alive, because they had taken the pill and they didn't understand what this medical emergency was going to be for them. On another form relating to uh, complications with cardiac arrest, there's no reference made to 911. What if you are a non-English speaking woman in our state? Well, they offer pictures, charts, and they try to implicate if you're in pain or you're bleeding, instead of going to the hospital, call the clinic number. There is no reference to 911 if you're a non-English speaking woman in this state. On another form, it says, if you don't hear back from the Planned Parenthood number in 20 minutes, then call 911. What if that's your baby girl that's bleeding out? 20 minutes matters. Let me address our findings on Planned Parenthood's staff written action policies, if it becomes necessary for them to call 911. This is in their written plans. Number one, the staff is instructed to request no sirens. Clearly, the inability for EMS to use their sirens on an emergency vehicle will likely de de to delay the help that that patient needs. What if that's someone you love when minutes count? No sirens? Seriously? All right, here's another one. EMS, um, when, when the staff calls EMS, they're not allowed to say that it is abortion related. They're only allowed to give information such as patient in the 20s, patient bleeding. Again, they refuse to give EMS the necessary information, the critical information needed as they rush to assist a critical patient. That's callous. That's thoughtless for our Missouri women. Once EMS arrives, they are not to be admitted to the procedure room. Not to be admitted to the procedure room? Even junior high students know you don't move someone in a critical condition. So who's moving them? How are they moving them? EMS is not allowed to do that. That's a job for trained EMS personnel, yet our women at Planned Parenthood are denied that. Planned Parenthood's actions are irresponsible. They're extremely callous to our very vulnerable women, and I believe may very well constitute medical malpractice. So let me end with this. It doesn't matter which side of the abortion issue you find yourself standing. That's not what this is about. This is about the safety our Missouri, of our Missouri women. It's about quality health care that you and I would consider standard in any other circumstance. Why is it denied to our vulnerable women at Planned Parenthood? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, the committee had some issues on the use or non-use of the drug digoxin when used in the second trimester of an abortion. Um, digoxin is a drug that has been around a long time and it's used mainly nowadays for atrial fibrillation because it slows the heart rate down. And by using digoxin uh, in, in an abortion procedure or before the abortion procedure has, has occurred, uh, it stops the heart and it kills, it kills the baby. Um, Planned Parenthood documents show that 90% of women preferred that digoxin be used so that they would know that the baby was dead before the abortion procedure started. Planned Parenthood's uh, internal documents indicate the use of this drug during the second trimester in order to help the clinician avoid a federal abortion law, which is called the Infant Born Alive Law. However, in videos taken by uh, key Planned Parenthood executives, they discuss a, a deliberate efforts to avoid using this drug as to not spoil the fetal tissue. We know that some of these same executives also specifically named 
Planned Parenthood of St. Louis as a place to target for this activity regarding fetal cells. We believe, this committee believes, that Planned Parenthood should elaborate on its use of digoxin and whether or not the remains of each baby were administered digoxin before the procedure. My portion of the report is dealing with uh, business licenses with Dr. Miller and pathology services, and we found that uh, extensive non-compliance was found uh, in the last 10 years. Two occasions went by where uh, he let his business license elapse for the entire year, and two occasions in 2008 and 2013, it elapsed for part of the year. It, and then in 2015, his business license was administratively dissolved for, for that, that year as well. In 2016, he failed to submit uh, his registration on time until after the 30th. And when he testified in 2015 in front of the House hearing, his, his license had been administratively dissolved three weeks prior. I could have the senator's come up. Uh, we've passed out a report, about a nine-page report, I think, right, Lauren? Did we give that up yet? Yes, yes, uh, yes. That the committee uh, produced, and uh, we'll get everybody up here, and then we'll take a few questions. Uh, see what's on your mind about Did anybody look at these documents besides this group of centers? Uh, I believe Todd Scott, who's our counsel, uh, Senator Richard, Senator Schaefer, and Senator Schmidt were all involved in that. So, no one who is not pro life, no one who is. No, that's not true, Bob. Chris Chappie yeah. looked at them. That's correct. And they also had their senators had the ability to look at it. I don't know if they did. I, I note that none of the senators, none of the Democratic senators um, who were named to the Sanctity of Life Committee's names, are even on the back here looking for a signature. Was this report provided to the minority party members of the committee? Were the documents, were the minority party members invited to look at the documents and to, provide, to create their own report? I think what's important, Rudy, is really more than a committee because the committee administratively dissolved at the beginning of the session since it was an interim committee. But we had specific members that were concerned about the resolution that I filed to enforce by subpoena the request for the documents. And so really that's why you see that, is that that's senators that took a particular interest in those resolutions. So it's not a committee report, Ruby. That's why the committee's not. So what's next? You know, I, I think the thing that this shows more than anything is, number one, there's either incredibly sloppy record keeping or there's an intentional, you know, obfuscation, an attempt to make it very difficult to find out what in fact happens. I think the example that I gave where you've got a state law that says for every abortion that is performed, uh, the majority of, of body parts from that are supposed to be preserved in formulin or some preservative with a representative sample going to the pathologist. Yet what you have is Planned Parenthood admitting, and it shows in the documents as well, the, entire, uh, the entirety of the aborted uh, body going to the pathologist so it does not put a formula because remember if you are going to try and use body parts for, for research they're destroyed once they're put in formula and they're no longer useful for that purpose so it begs the question of why is everything going to the pathologist but then when you look at what we found from the pathologist it's either ridiculously sloppy record keeping that would get any pathologist in the private practice of medicine sued in very short order or disbarred it somehow appears to be uh, acceptable in this regard to have ill-kept records, no information on pathology reports. So it makes it virtually impossible to determine what happens. But again, that shows the absurdity of the Supreme Court's decision last week because you have the same issue whether it's a pathology report from an abortion clinic or whether it's a pathology report from another ambulatory surgery center. And the same things that apply to follow-up procedures from a facility that provides colonoscopies or vein care also applies to abortion clinic. I mean, I think what begs the question from the Supreme Court's decision is, does that mean that we can't require fire extinguishers, hallways of the size to have a gurney? And those are the things that we have to figure out from, from what is a very ill-reasoned opinion from the Supreme Court. And I would, and I would also add, too, that uh, uh, if you combine the testimony that we heard last year from the Director of Health, along with the documents that we had an opportunity to review, what is clear is that there are many things that are unclear. Um, for example, the, the documents and the contract that was produced is missing perhaps the most substantive piece of that contract, which is the confidentiality clause, which is incorporated into the two-pager that we saw that only lists the cost structure for the pathologist. 
We don't know what the pathologist did. Um, we have we have really have no idea. Um, we haven't seen any contracts from him with MediSure, which is the Indiana uh, company that got in hot water, legal hot water, for illegally disposing of um, fetal uh, remains last spring, this past spring that we saw. So, and, and so all sort of things point to this pathologist when you're sort of going from Planned Parenthood to the pathologist, and the pathologist has produced nothing and has pleaded the Fifth Amendment uh, possibly for fear of criminal prosecution. So we just, and it's his constitutional right to do so, but it certainly leaves a lot of unanswered questions. Is that plan current? Is there a distinction between your concerns about plan current as an organization and your concerns about this pathologist who is a contractor and is not a plan current employee? Well, I, would, I guess I would, uh, we have known unknowns and then unknown unknowns. You have known unknowns in that we know that the documents that are produced by Planned Parenthood are incomplete. They cannot locate the confidentiality agreement, which I would imagine has a lot, has a great deal of importance in this discussion. They cannot produce it. They don't know where it's at. And again, the Attorney General did not note that uh, in his report that the contract was indeed incomplete. So the agreement between the pathologist and Planned Parenthood that Planned Parenthood agreed to produce is incomplete. Dr. Miller.